Good evening, fight fans. It is I, uh, your mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Radledge. And this is the history of heavyweight championship boxing, chapter 16. Tonight, we are looking at the Klitschko brothers. Yes, we are doing a wide and deep examination of the Klitschko era, the last era before modern times. So, it's actually our last podcast before we do the epilogue on this series. So, it's been fun. You know, I've really enjoyed doing this. I've learned a lot, and I'm excited to talk about the Klitschko brothers. And here to help me do that is the punchy pugilist himself, my boxing historian, a man who's going to get a job at Peacock and the WWE Network, and he's going to put back all of those offensive, uh, quote-unquote, offensive uh, segments featuring a half-painted Roddy Piper. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Pat Mullen, how do you do, sir? Jeez, Mark, your arms look huge today. So <laughs> vascular. <laughs> Thank you, Johnny. Ace. How you doing tonight? Mark, you know, we haven't done this show in a little while. We had a little bit of time off through, you know, some, some things going on. Spring fever catching us and a lot of shows on the network going on and strong with the uh, I'm trying to think of when the last time we recorded was, and uh, I think it, in fact, it, it's it been 7,015 days <laughs> since you took my mic away. <laughs> it's a great song. It is a great song. What, you were in the chat tonight, like, just all going all kinds of 80s ballads and whatnot. What got into you? Uh, Pinot Grigio, because... Normally, it'd be Miller time when we're doing this show, cause, you know, or PBR or whatever, because we're drinking beers and we're talking men and heavyweights. But we're talking some classy individuals tonight with doctorates, so I, I changed it up and I uh, you know, brought a classy beverage out. Perfect. So we are talking about the Klitschko era. We're going to do these one at a time. We're going to talk Vladimir Klitschko and then his brother Vitaly uh, and the amount of time they spent dominating the heavyweight division. And, you know, I started watching boxing in earnest um, probably little by little to a lot over the past 10 years. And in that time, like I can go back and remember the actual uh, Klitschko Hay fight, which we'll talk about <laughs> later, which made Dana White cry. Um, not just remember. Dana. <laughs> yeah, not just Dana. Um, I can go I, I, all the way back. I think it was 2011. Uh, I can go all the way back to, you know, wh remember watching that fight and everything. And the the layman consensus, the general consensus out there is that the Klitschko brothers destroyed the heavyweight division. Just, you know, after Lennox Lewis... Not, these... not in the way we would normally talk about. Not in the way Mike Tyson destroyed the 80s heavyweight division. No, like destroyed interest in it. You know, yes. they essentially took the titles hostage, took them to Europe. No one ever saw them again. No one, ever saw, no one in America ever saw them fight. And... For the decade or so that they dominated the division, um, American interest in heavyweight boxing waned. And again, it was said that these two brothers, between their lackluster style, their fighting in Europe, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, just killed interest. And it wasn't until AJ, Deontay, Tyson come along that things finally start to pick up again. What do you say to that? I'm going to start us off with a quote from the elder brother Vitali. And to give you some background to this, um, both of these brothers are highly educated individuals. They both have PhDs, hence their nicknames of Dr. Iron Fist and Dr. Steelhammer. Um, one of Vitali's best friends is Vladimir Kremnik, who is a noted chess champion on the level of Gary Kasparov, Bobby Fischer. Those guys are like the Muhammad Ali and, you know, the Sugar Ray Robinson of chess. And uh, Klitschko has commented in making this comparison saying, chess is similar to boxing. You need to develop a strategy and think two or three steps ahead about what your opponent is doing. You have to be smart. But what's the difference between chess and boxing? In chess, nobody is an expert, but everybody plays. In boxing, everybody's an expert, but nobody fights. <laughs> and... That's probably a pretty fair assessment of the assessment given to him and Vladimir. You have to understand that these guys were not face-first brawlers. Who These guys were scientists practicing their science in the milieu of, or minutia of boxing. 
you know, almost how Jim Morrison was not a rock singer. Jim Morrison was a crooner working in the rock milieu, which I like, hence Rip Taylor's quote. <laughs> These guys were not the typical heavyweights, despite the size, despite everything about them. These guys were scientific fighters who were out there to show the ability and practition the sport at its highest level on their end as opposed to their opponent's end. And while that may not have been the most exciting or riveting uh, viewer experience, particularly for American audiences, they did a lot of good for heavyweight boxing in Europe, particularly Germany and their native Ukraine. Um, and to be fair, the reason they were so dominant is in part because they were so good and in part because the United States had drifted away from creating top flight heavyweights for a number of reasons that we've somewhat talked about on this show, kind of going back to our uh, Forgotten Sons episode um, a little bit where there were a lot of things that circumstances created and forged a lot of great heavyweight fighters over time. And then starting in the 1980s and going forward, there was less emphasis on trying to do that. And as a result, the heavyweight division faltered. We had the last remnants of some great heavyweights come up through the 90s. But even to this day, American heavyweights are kind of uh, second fiddle to majority European-based heavyweights. It's funny. They just announced uh, Andy Ruiz, who for a cup of coffee was the – uh, unified heavyweight champion when he upset Anthony Joshua a couple of years ago, and he's actually headlining a pay per view. I believe it's Chris yeah. Ariola. Who's he headlining with? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Who, never... at one time. And, and again, we'll, and we'll talk about Chris Ariola on this show too in a little while. At one time, Chris Ariola was thought of as the best American heavyweight, and we'll put into perspective why that's not a great thing. Um. Yeah, it's Chris Ariola. I just checked. Yeah, I um, people are looking at that, and I and I mentioned it, and we'll we'll get into the actual Klitschko brothers. But you know, when you look at American heavyweights, like if you think about like the top ten heavyweights right now, uh, you know you have Anthony Joshua who's British, you have Tyson Fury who's British, um, well I, I, Irish but in Britain, yeah, um, not 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 American, and you know you have Deontay Wilder who was at the top of the heap for there for a while there, but you know, he drew and then lost to Tyson Fury and he's never gotten back on the horse. Never will. Um, you have Alexander Usyk out there who came up from, I believe cruiserweight and, yes. you know, and then after that it's slim pickings. And it's like, you look at it. You're, you're looking at guys, to be honest, like Joseph Parker, mm -hmm. uh, Sasha Povetkin, Dillian White, the only American who's really uh, in there besides Wilder is Andy Ruiz. Right, that's what I was getting to. Like, when you think about homegrown American heavyweights, it's Deontay Wilder, Andy Ruiz, and then it's, like, nothing for a while. Everybody else is from Europe. Um, so it, the, the heavyweight division has evolved in a very weird way. I mean, I suppose you could say, like, Luis Ortiz is up there, but, you know, the last time we saw Luis Ortiz, he was getting knocked stupid by Deontay Wilder. On He's also Cuban, on steroids, and potentially 50 years old. Yeah, that's the other problem. All right. <laughs> uh, Vladimir Klitschko was born in Semi in what is now known as Kazakhstan. His father, Vladimir Klitschko, uh, born 47, died 2011, was a Soviet Air Force major general and a military attache of Ukraine in Germany. He was also one of the commanders in charge of cleaning up the effects of Chernobyl. Disaster. Which would explain the size of both Vladimir and Vitaly. <laughs> in 1986, and was afterward diagnosed with cancer. While five years Vitaly's junior, Vladimir took to boxing, while Vitaly's interest seemed more in combat karate and kickboxing, which had recently been unbanned in the Soviet Union. As amateurs in the late 80s and early 90s, Vladimir and Vitaly were known internationally, but Vladimir was seen as the bigger star due to Vitaly spending time fighting professionally kick uh, in professional kickboxing. Vladimir's amateur career would culminate with a super heavyweight gold medal in 1996 in the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta, Georgia. Vitaly had been a favorite to represent the Ukraine at the Olympics by winning the 1995 military games, but had tested positive for banned substances and thus was dismissed from the team. Both would prepare to turn professional in 1996 and were made several offers by American promoters, including Don King. 
King invited the brothers to his home, offering them a substantial amount of money with very little on the back end, and lost them completely. While acting out that he was playing a sonata by Mozart on a piano, the brothers noticed that it was a player piano cementing him in their eyes as a con artist. You can't put one over on these guys. Oh, Don. They would sign with German-based Universum, and both would be trained as professionals by Fritz uh, Sudnik. Uh, so, Vladimir will win his first uh, ma- major, in quotes, uh, title on... February 14th, 1998, in the Maritime Hotel in Stuttgart, Germany, against Marcus McIntyre, uh, and he will win the vacant WBC International Heavyweight title. Vladimir was known as an aggressive puncher in his early career, and only one of his first 24 opponents lasted to a decision. Veteran Everett Martin, lasting a scheduled eight rounds, offering little resistance. He would win his first, as I said, he would win his first professional title, knocking out Marcus McIntyre in three rounds. In that contest... As I said, he won the vacant WBC International Heavyweight title. However, these poor guys and the, you know, stumbling here, hither and thither, Vlad would uh, suffer a shocking upset loss to 24 and 13 German Ross Purity. Purity had noted that Klitschko had never had to go past eight rounds, and when he did go eight, he looked very tired. Purity intended to allow Klitschko to punch himself out, which he did, allowing Purity to tee off on a defensive Vlad for a KO win, which occurred in the 11th round of 12 on December 5th, 1998 at the Palace of Sports in Kiev, Ukraine, at which point Ross Purity became the WBC International Heavyweight Champion. In an effort to rehab his career, Vladimir was matched against former world title challengers Phil Jackson and Axel Schultz. And we know Axel Schultz from previous podcasts. And friend contenders Maurice Harris and David Bostis. A string of eight wins allowed Vlad to challenge for the then unrecognized WBO World Championship against Chris Bird. And that takes place in Cologne, Germany on October 14th in the year 2000, uh, at which point he wins by unanimous decision. Now, tell me about this fight, Pat. Tell me about Chris Bird versus Vladimir Klitschko. Bird had actually won the title from Vladimir's brother Vitaly in a fight where Vitaly was largely ahead the entire time, but had torn his rotator cuff. And Bird was the beneficiary of Vitaly deciding discretion was the better part of valor and deciding not to fight on. Um, Now, Bird is at this time a top 10 heavyweight, absolutely. He's a southpaw. He had actually fought as a middleweight on the 92 U.S. Olympic team, but as a professional decided, I have to fight as a heavyweight to make some money in this game. And... He was a southpaw. He was very elusive. And while not a tremendous puncher, was you know able to mount significant enough offense to confuse guys, befuddle them, and make them miss and counter and win on points quite often. He had no such luck in this fight against Vladimir, who dropped him multiple times. He really didn't have an answer trying to get inside of Vladimir's reach, fighting the style he fought. And Vlad was also motivated by the idea that he wanted revenge for his brother, his older brother Vitaly, who should have, in the eyes of many, won this fight had he not torn his shoulder. But he comes out and just delivers a real clinic on how to beat a guy up against poor Chris Bird, this undersized defensive specialist. And uh, it's very one-sided, and Vlad walks away with, at the time, what's an unrecognized heavyweight title. So, because it's not recognized, um, and he's not a recognized heavyweight champion, technically, um, he, uh, after beating Bird in dominant fashion, that stamped Vladimir as a legitimate contender. Vlad would reel off five straight defenses, winning all by KO, including be- becoming the first man to stop Ray Mercer, who had insulted him by calling him Russian Tommy Morrison. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> There's all kinds of stuff connotated with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's yeah. just go with the fact that he thought he was just a big puncher with a great physique who uh, couldn't last the distance. Uh, let's ignore the other stuff with that. But I will tell you, uh, as an aside, there was a night where uh, on August 4th of 2001, it was on the undercard of the Bones Adams Pauli Ayala pay-per-view. Uh, look that one up, kids. Uh, Vlad fought Charles Shuford in the heavyweight fight and knocked him out in six rounds. Uh, Shuford is best known for playing George Foreman in the movie Ali and actually was accompanied to ringside by Will Smith. However, Vladimir is not the only guy who won a fight on that night. 
as I also scored a fourth-round knockout of Nick DeCesarac on that night in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> well done. Well, as great as Vladimir Klitschko is, and he's a Hall of Fame boxer, and he's nobody to sniff at, he, he is not without his stumbling blocks. And the next one comes in his 42nd fight, where he loses to Corey Sanders by TKO in the second round on March 8, 2003, in Hanover, Germany. Uh, and he loses the WBO heavyweight title. This was supposed to be a routine defense, um, but uh, Corey Sanders is a hard punch in Southpaw from South Africa. And this is an HBO showcase. I believe this was like HBO Dark, wasn't it? Uh, Boxing After this Dark. This was Boxing After Dark, yes. Yeah, I was really surprised to see that. It's just real, as an aside, why would they put this on HBO Boxing After Dark? Because that's supposed to be like the up and comer show. To be fair, at the time, the only sh- the only way you can get on HBO World Championship Boxing up until about '04, a year after this, was if you held a WBC, WBA, or IBF World Championship, as those were the recognized world championships. The WBO would not be recognized until about another year after this, for whatever cockamamie reason, etc. But that that's essentially why this was a Boxing After Dark show. But they were also in the business at the time of trying to hype up Vladimir Klitschko, and Boxing After Dark was the right way to go about it, in theory. In theory. So yeah, Klitschko's caught completely off guard by the power of Sanders, who Jack Dempsey'd him four times in two rounds to score the Ring Magazine upset of the year for 2003. So I watched this earlier today, Pat. This was less a boxing match and more of a mugging. And Vladimir Klitschko, there's a couple of times that he gets knocked down, he gets back up, they put the camera on him, and he's like, I don't know if I want to be here anymore. I don't know what the hell's going on. What happened? Uh, hey, Corey Sanders' left hand happened and caught Vladimir cold. Um, Corey Sanders isn't a guy who gets talked about a lot for whatever reason, um, but he, he's, um, you know... You have a big guy with a really tremendous punch, and he's dangerous for anybody. Um, I, if you've never seen this fight, you need to look up a boxing after dark fight that happened between Corey Sanders and Asim Rahman, where essentially you have two guys who are just loaded with power in their power hand, going back and forth, rock 'em sock 'em robots. But aside from just his power, Corey Sanders is a large guy with a tremendous amount of range, and. Vladimir just seemed caught off guard by having to deal with his size and reach, and that allowed Corey to get that left hand home early. And when he lands that first real solid left hand, Vladimir's in trouble immediately and doesn't really know how to react to it because this isn't like Ross Purity where he's just tired and taking punches and doesn't know how to respond. He's legitimately hurt and doesn't know how to deal with that because it's not something he's ever faced before. And I can remember watching this fight live and almost, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, because I know we're trying to class the show up while I'm drinking wine, I almost shit my pants watching this. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God, he's he like and then I like I'm watching this and he's getting hurt and I'm flashing back to Rocky Four when Duke is yelling at Rocky in the corner, he's not a machine, he's a man. And because none of us had ever seen Vladimir get hurt. That wasn't something we knew was really a part of what would put him together. And my cousin at the time, who was a huge Vladimir fan, is telling everybody how this is going to be the guy. Uh, you know, he wasn't there at the time. I, he, was, he wasn't watching it. He was out. And I called him after the fight. And uh, he was just assuming this was another Klitschko showcase. And I told him, I was like, he done got murdered. <laughs> Not a good luck. Um, so after losing to Sanders, Vladimir would part ways with trainer uh, Sidney Nick and hire Emmanuel Stewart. Stewart had been credited with providing the careers of heavyweight champion Lennox Lewis after a similar defeat, which we talked about in our last podcast. Stewart would guide Vlad to two wins against nondescript opposition before Vladimir fought Lamont Brewster for the vacant but finally recognized WBO Brewster. heavyweight championship. Uh, Klitschko dominated Brewster for four rounds and knocked him down, but seemed to tire hard in the fifth round, where Brewster pounded on him, forcing the referee to stop the fight. After Klitschko was examined in a hospital where his blood sugar was twice the normal reading, and there was alleged tampering with uh, Vladimir. Joe Souza, who had long served as Vlad's cutman, was fired after using Vaseline on Vlad's body, which is something he had never done before. He was replaced by Vitaly's cutman, Jacob Stitch Duran. Vladimir and Manny went back to the drawing board and instead of looking for easy fights, insisted on finding ranked contenders. 
Uh, Vlad would fight top 10 rated Devarrell Williamson, and despite a flash knockdown... One of the best nicknames ever for Devarrell Williamson. And most accurate. Do you know what it was, Mark? What was it? Touch of sleep. Yeah. <laughs> because his fights ended in two ways. Either he hit a guy and they fell down and went to sleep, or it was so boring that you went to sleep while watching the fight. <laughs> So despite a flash knockdown, uh, he would win a technical decision after an accidental head clash. He would go on to KO unbeaten Cuban expat Alicio Castillo, and then he would secure a mandatory contender fight with the unbeaten KO artist Samuel Peter of Nigeria, who was a 7-5 to five favorite to beat Vlad. And this one is right here in America. It's uh, September 24th, 2005 at the Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City, and it's for the WBC, NABF, and WBO, NABO heavyweight titles. And yikes. He wins. He wins a unanimous decision, but he's not without his lumps. What happened here, sir? Samuel Peter punches very hard. And uh, for whatever reason, maybe because he was at the time promoted by Don King, who knows, Sam Peter used to get away with more rabid punches than probably any fighter I've ever seen. And a lot of the punches that Vlad got hit with were, to be fair, behind the head which is supposed to be illegal and not a scoring blow, but he was never warned, and they were, you know, when the referee doesn't warn you, you have to consider it a scoring blow, even if it's below the belt or behind the head, etc. Vlad got hit behind the head with quite a few overhand rights as this went on, and Peter was known for a murderous left hook, one that put Jeremy Williams into another universe before this fight. Um, just really, he was a vicious puncher. He knocked out my friend Oleg Miskayev to win the WBC title. Peter Peter was a different breed at the time, and everybody was really on him. And, yeah, he hurt Vlad a couple times, and then there was one round he, he scored a knockdown, and another round he scored two knockdowns. But I think what needs to be underscored here is Vlad got up from each of those knockdowns, and... Aside from those, won the vast majority of rounds by his own power punching and backing Samuel Peter up, who didn't necessarily have the best defense because of how squat and thick he was and a huge, massive neck that was almost invisible, but it was there. Um, he Vlad backed him off multiple times, and even after Peter dropped him late hard twice, Vlad came back and won the next round on those cards to kind of try to prove himself as I, I don't crumble under pressure I can do this and he won a lot of respect for his performance in that fight the win set Vladimir up to challenge the IBF heavyweight title held by former victim Chris Bird Klitschko again battered the seemingly overmatched Bird even worse than their first outing stopping him in seven rounds to have the first official reign as a recognized world champion his popularity on the rise finally Klitschko knocked out number one contender American Calvin Brock, knocked out Ray Austin, and claimed revenge on Lamont Brewster with a six-round KO to successfully defend his title for a third time, setting up a unification bout with WO champion Sultan uh, Ibra Ibra Ibrahimov. Thank you. In Madison Square Garden. In a fight that would define Klitschko's career for his detractors, Vladimir would win a dull affair uh, with Ibrahimov fighting cautiously and not taking risks to get inside of Vladimir's reach while Vladimir fought safely behind his jab, not taking unnecessary chances. I want to take a minute and just kind of talk about that because when we first started the series, we talked a lot about um, the technique of boxing as it evolved over time and what different guys did with it and how the sport e had evolved over 100 years. But one of the things I noticed about watching Vladimir Klitschko especially fight, um, obviously him and his brother are great technicians, but I think the, the, their best punch is their jab. From what I saw, he really utilizes the jab, I think, in the most orthodox and textbook way you are supposed to as a boxer. He really does use it to set up his power punches, and he throws a lot of jabs. The other thing about him that I noticed was that despite the fact that you know he, he wins a, a most of his fights by decision to one degree or another. Um, one of the things that gets cited about him is the high volume of punches that he throws. He is a workman's boxer. He does not stop throwing punches unless someone's punching him in the head. Absolutely. He, he really 
is on his game to try to – it's a weird way to say it, but his offense in many respects is his defense because as soon as his opponent is not punching, he's trying to stymie them as much as he can. And the best way he knows to do that is to peck and paw with that jab and then immediately follow with either a big right hand behind it or he feints the right hand and comes back with a left hook that has some meat on it. It's a power on it to try to make a guy question, oh, my God, I, I can't open up. He's going to hit me with these things. I, I need to back off. The the Ibrahimov fight is a very dull fight. Like, there's no way to clean that up. It is what it is. I watched that fight live, and it was from Madison Square Garden. It was hyped up as, the, you know, these two great European heavyweights are going to fight. And we, we referenced chess earlier. This was more a physical chess match than it was a great heavyweight championship fight. And that's why casual viewers were so detracted by it. Whereas people like myself who look a lot for the science of what's going on and understanding of it, we'll call a fight a dull fight, but there's still things we can pick out of it where I'm very impressed by a certain aspect of this as to why it's a dull fight, you know? Is it a dull fight because nobody's engaging, or is it, is it a dull fight because this guy is so comprehensively outclassing the other that he doesn't know how to engage or doesn't want to out of fear for the power? And to be honest, when Klitschko fought Ibrahimov, it seemed like Ibrahimov was just afraid of getting hit with Vladimir's power punches, which, to his credit, would you know really put him over as a huge puncher. But it made for a very dull fight, for, especially you're in the garden, the home of Ali Frazier won in so many great heavyweight fights over the years, and you're in the New York audience where they, they, they love you or they hate you. There's no in between. And this was on HBO where they were really had been pushing Vladimir as, you know, this is our heavyweight champion. This is the guy you're going to see. This is the champ. And it really resulted in a lackluster performance and viewing and – you know, th this goes back to when the pub viewing public was got, was used to guys with less technical ability but more desire because of that lack of technique to try to end things or, or win on any cost they can. If you, were, if you were not an American or a Russian, right, and you were watching Bobby Fischer play Gary Kasparov in chess, you have no rooting interest in that. How exciting is it to watch two guys sit at an edge of a table and move little plastic pieces around? Right. That's kind of what it became in that fight for a lot of people with Klitschko and Ibrahimov is watching two guys play chess without a rooting interest. It makes sense. It totally makes sense. Despite a high knockout rate, finishing off faded former champion Hasim Rahman near seven foot southpaw Tony Thompson twice, Eddie Chambers and Samuel Peter in a rematch, and then he gets his most high profile fight to date against uh WBA champion Ruslov uh Shaga Sh Shagayev. Shagayev, damn it. To capture three of the four active heavyweight titles with his brother Vitali, who we'll talk about soon, holding the WBC title. And I'm uh, gonna I'm gonna make a bold statement right now. Mm-hmm. Had it not been for the brothers Klitschko, I firmly believe that Shigaev would have been the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Okay, so why do you say that? Shigaev was a very good technician. Shigaev had power in both hands, but particularly his lead right. Shigaev was a very strong puncher, could take a good punch and was not afraid to take chances to try to win a fight. He was a very, very good fighter who was well-schooled, had seemingly all the tools you need to become a great heavyweight. But as has happened to so many others over time, there was, well, in this case, not only one guy who was more equipped, but two guys who were more equipped than he was to really dominate. And it's a shame because I think Chigayev is a great fighter, who put on a lot of good fights, but he's just not on the level of the two guys who were dominating the division at the time. Right. Well, that fight takes place on June 20th, 2009 in Germany, and uh, Klitschko retains the IBF, WBO, and 
and IBO heavyweight titles, and he wins the vacant ring heavyweight title. Which well, at that point gives him the credence as technically what would be considered the lineal heavyweight champion of the world because out of the four recognized heavyweight championships, he's captured three, which gives him more credence to the lineal title than the person who has only captured one heavyweight championship at this time, which would be his brother, Vitaly. So American audiences are growing restless with Klitschko's style of fighting, which we just talked about. European audiences, however, continue to flock by the thousands to his fights in Germany, Russia, and Switzerland, doing huge attendance numbers and TV ratings. Klitschko would continue his winning ways defending his championship against unbeaten Polish giant Marius Wach, the highly touted and unbeaten Alexander Povetkin, who is fighting this weekend in a rematch yes. with uh, Delane White, and unanimous number one contender Kubrat Pulev, uh, who Anthony Joshua hit over the head in December on his own. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with some lesser opponents in between. Perhaps one title defense standing out above all others was the title defense against David Haig, which we referenced uh, earlier. Oh we'll boy. talk about this. Yeah. So Hay is the former undisputed Cruiserweight champion, and he had spewed hateful verbiage towards both brothers while trying to secure a title shot at either one of them. After multiple delays, Hay would fight Vladimir, and despite promises of decapitation from Hay, he was stymied for 12 rounds by Klitschko's control of distance and range. Rarely ever landing a meaningful punch while being outclassed over 12 rounds, losing a one-sided decision and blaming his performance, because this is becoming a thing, on a broken toe, which was ra- <laughs> roundly and resoundingly laughed at by the media as it should have been. Either way, this is where Klitschko uh, steps up and becomes an international superstar um, and the recognized world heavyweight champion as he is awarded the WBA super heavyweight title along with the IBF WBO IBO and ring heavyweight titles he's despite the fact that this fight sucked and Pat's going to tell you how much it sucked (laughs) he's going to tell you how much it sucked in just a moment Um, on this day on July 2nd 2011 in Hamburg Germany uh, Klitschko became the guy how did this fight go Pat Hay refused to engage, would once in a while throw a 3-2 combination, which is a left hook right hand combination, that was not set up well and literally wound up with him being clinched with Vladimir, who saw it coming, would pick it off with his arms, hold on to Hay, and then the referee would break them, and then Vladimir would jab him backward, with Hay having no response for it. And Hay seemed tentative and refused to, like I said, refused to engage for, you know, the majority of the rounds of the fight. I think, I think I tried to give Hay as much credit as I could on the scorecards while watching this live. This is really scarring to bring back the memory of it, so you have to forgive me <laughs> because it was it was a lousy fight. There's no other way to say it. Um, every heavyweight champion in history who is of any level that has held the title for any length of time is going to have a stinker of a fight, whether it's either against an overmatched opponent or whether it's against uh, somebody who just fights very tentatively and afraid to make make a stand. And the problem with this fight for Vladimir, which is not even his fault, is that Hay did such a hype job talking about how he wanted to decapitate the brothers and he's going to knock them out, and he's going to do all these things, he's going to save, whatever. And instead of fighting like a guy who was out there to decapitate somebody, he went out there as a guy who was looking to land a lucky shot after being afraid of being hit. And after the fight, when when talking to the HBO correspondent Larry Merchant, blamed the performance on a broken toe. I've broken the big toe in my left foot. It's legitimately the only bone I've actually broken, and broken it repeatedly, because once a bone breaks, it's more susceptible to be broken again. I don't know. My mom drank a lot of milk, folks. I have pretty good bones that don't break. My muscles tear, but my bones don't break. On set broken toe, I've done a lot of things. I'm not a professional athlete. I've never been the cruiserweight champion of the world much as I would like to be. 
I've never won a bogus recognition as a heavyweight champion the way Hay did. So David Hay is probably at his peak in much better shape than I am at my peak. I can't see how a broken toe would stymie me with trying to, to decapitate somebody who I profess so much hatred for that that would stop me from accomplishing my mission. And David Hay, despite all this talk, everything, the HBO face-offs, talking to every press person he could, went out there and fought like a coward. There's no other way to say it. And I try not to be disrespectful of anybody who steps into the ring at any point, but to be quite honest, for the money he was making, for the things he said, for everything he did prior to the fight, he fought like a coward who was afraid of Vladimir Klitschko. And Vladimir, in my opinion, to his credit, did not allow emotion to override his fight performance. Because when somebody says these hateful, vile things to you and, and talks about you, your family, etc., they want to generate an emotional response so that you will not fight your optimal fight. You're going to fight their fight where they have a chance to hurt you and sting you. And Vladimir just basically closed all that out and decided the best way I can humble this guy is to win as many rounds as possible from him and not let him win any. And someone like me who's a former boxer, who can appreciate things, who's been in that scenario before, I completely understand and I can support that methodology of not, not only not wanting to, to be humiliated or lose to somebody who, who said these things and whatever, but just to, to beat them and beat them comprehensively. The problem with that is the general public doesn't understand that. And when you get to the general public, when they have somebody who's saying they want to decapitate somebody, they're expecting a fight. They're expecting Jack Dempsey versus... Louis Furpo, they're expecting Holyfield Bow, they're expecting these things and whether that's realistic or not unfortunately it doesn't matter because that's what the public has been told to perceive and expect and rather than that we saw a chess match where one guy just had no, one guy was playing checkers one guy was playing chess I remember that fight very clearly um, I never, because the UFC had a pay-per-view that night and yes, White's UFC like, 132, which wound up being a great card. And this was very much at the time of UFC versus boxing. What's better? Right. And Dana White's like, we're not going on the air until this is done. And I remember people were trying to ask Dana White questions about the pay-per-view. And he's like, can we just talk about that terrible boxing match first? <laughs> like, that hurt him. That hurt him deeply. It hurt it all It did, us. because Dana's still a <laughs> boxing fan regardless of what he does. And it didn't help the UFC put on a really great show that night. Hmm. Uh, with Cruz and Faber and Vanderlei and Lieben. I remember it really well, actually, because my whole family was gathered together to watch the Klitschko hate fight. And then we hung out to watch the UFC show after, and we were like, good Lord, there's a difference in these two th- these two cards tonight. What was so funny was, like, David Hay had this whole, like, Apollo... Um... Uh, Apollo Creed, you know, Rocky. In the in the, in, the, in, in Rocky too, yeah, like yeah. With the stallion chicken thing. Yeah. Right. He had the you know, he had the top hat on and everything, and then they did the skit with George Foreman and, and Klitschko where they're like reading a newspaper. It was just there was so much pomp and circumstance. Like the way this was promoted, um, and the amount of effort put into marketing it and putting on a presentation, and then the fight doesn't deliver. It's like, ugh. It, it sometimes it's 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 it really sometimes hurts to be a combat sports fan. Like it's just awful. You know what? I look at it as that was an incredible build up, and honestly, what they gave us with the the walkout with the holograms of George Foreman and Joe Frazier and Lennox Luke, my that was an ama- that was that made up to me for the fight itself. But then we got UFC later that night where Tito Ortiz won a fight against Ryan Bader by submission. Right, and in a fight he was supposed to lose to Bader. Like, that was Bader on the come-up, and Tito Ortiz was supposed to be fed to him, and, like, Tito Ortiz, like, Tito Ortiz was the most surprised person on earth that he won. He was like, holy shit! And I remember he said something stupid afterwards, but... but he did, and we got that, that Vanderlei Lieben brawl that lasted right. all 20 some odd seconds, but was fun, <laughs> and Cruz in favor, where it was a technical fight, but it was a fun technical fight, as opposed to Klitschko Hay, and that was a shame. And Cruz and Faber were like real, real rivals. Like they, they hated each other, if I remember correctly. 
think Dominic Much Cruz still hates Much in the same way that we got the vitriol between Vla- uh, Vladimir and David Hay, but not not quite to the unprofessional level, we'll call it, that uh, <laughs> right. nobody was calling for decapitations. So the problem with... The ultimate problem with the David Hay fight is on because on the one hand he's the man now he's the un, he other than the fact that he doesn't have the WBC belt he is you know he has nine tenths of the world championship he is pretty much recognized as the nearly undisputed champion um, heavyweight champion in boxing yet kind of like Lennox Lewis and kind of like some of these other guys that we've talked about over the history of sixteen chapters just not able to capture the hearts and minds of Americans. Like, had he beat... Had he threw, threw David Hay a vicious, violent beating and given the American audiences who were tuned into HBO that afternoon the blood contest they wanted, I think we're having a different conversation. On the other I hand... Think up, the, I think you bring up a good point, too, that that fight aired live in the afternoon on a Saturday. Right. Not Saturday night in prime time. It was actually accessible to more people... Because of that, and there was so much hope for that, and it, when the fight itself did not deliver the expected results, you can actually even look at Klitschko's uh, millions of viewers, Vla- Vladimir that is, the millions of viewers per fight that Vladimir held after that, that's where he peaks in terms of his viewership, right. and while he still does good numbers after that, nothing ever comes close to reassembling that viewership. Well, he also goes off a cliff after this. So he has one more uh, successful title defense against Philadelphia-based Bryant Jennings. Well, Madison. no, he, he does. He, de- he defends his title after that. Very. He has uh, what is it? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, sorry. Seven. He has, he has eight title defenses after that. To be fair. Correct. You're you're absolutely right. Um, it's just that's the one of the bunch that's what was most worth talking about. Culminating with the Brian Jennings man at Madison Square Garden, and then he has he goes on a two fight skid, and that's the end of his career. So the first one is uh, he loses to now WBC. But let's and let, let's be Javier. fair. Yes, D- during that said time, he does beat Alexander Povetkin, Sasha Povetkin. Yeah, I watched that fight too. <laughs> and the, and the, you know what I remember about the Povetkin fight, other than it was on Epic, which was weird at the time. Was uh, I think it was Teddy Atlas <laughs> screaming in Pavetkin's face? Do it for your family. You got you got, you know. And Pavetkin just has this like <laughs> thousand yard stare. <laughs> it's like <laughs> okay. For, first of all, when it comes to Pavetkin and Teddy, <laughs> nothing will ever beat Pavetkin versus Ruslan Shagayev, where Teddy is screaming, "Do you believe in magic?" <laughs> because we can bring your father back tonight. Who? Povetkin recently dealt with the loss of his father. And Teddy, in his his best Teddy way, and I'll try to do it as much justice as I can. Do you believe in magic? Because there's times in life where you can bring people back. And tonight, you have the opportunity to bring your father back when you win this title. And they say that's his son. Is it that one or is it or, is it both of them where he's screaming in his face? Because I I could have sworn it it's was also. It's it's Teddy. Okay. He's trying to okay. motivate his guy onto victory. And in the Shigaya fight, it worked. He came out and he, he won the rest of the, he won a split decision and won won the fight. But yeah. <laughs> uh, against Vladimir, it didn't it didn't work out as well? No, no, it did not. But but again, Povetkin is a very good, very talented heavyweight. Uh, you know. Klitschko beat him, no question, over 12 rounds. You know, he, be, he beat Tony Thompson again, a very good heavyweight in twelve in, in six rounds as opposed to 12 when he fought him the first time. He beat Marius Vok, this big Polish heavyweight who everybody was on. He, he beat him pretty comprehensively. And, and, and you know, he, even Kubrat Pulev, Pulev, who recently fought for a heavyweight title, Klitschko already beat him in 2014 with a fifth-round knockout that leads us to the Brian Jennings fight that you're talking about. Right. right. Um, yeah, he now I'm I'm relooking at uh his record here. Yeah. He goes on quite a tear after um after Hay and he's actually like finishing fights. He you know, KOs Mormick in four, K- TKOs Tony Thompson in six, decisions with Walk, um TKOs uh Pineta in six, decisions with Favetkin as we just talked about, TKOs uh Lapai in five, Pulev in five and then it's a decision with Bryant, and then the two fights get, and then it's over. 
So my apologies to Vladimir Klitschko and you audience members. All right, so first up is Tyson Fury. And this is where uh, they go to a decision. Uh, this is in Dusseldorf, Germany, and he loses the WBA Super Dusseldorf. IBF. Uh, IBF, WBO, IBO, and ring heavyweight title. So this is the beginning of the skid. Um, so we've, we've talked about Tyson Fury before. We've talked about it when he um, had his rematch with Deontay Wilder. We talked about his style. Just real quickly, Pat, um, how, how and why was Tyson Fury able to confound Vladimir Klitschko in this fight? Uh, you know, a lot of angle changes... Tyson has a longer reach than Vladimir, which is something he was not used to dealing with, and allowed him to do these unorthodox angle changes and foot switches that Vladimir really didn't have experience dealing with and didn't really know how to respond to. And maybe more than anything, what Tyson did was, rather than promote his own offense against Vladimir, he limited what Vladimir's offense against him could be. Because Vladimir was very much reliant on drawing reactions out of people and understanding what they were going to do ahead of time like a chess player. When Tyson didn't decide to play chess, Tyson decided to play jazz music and go staccato on him. Vladimir really didn't know what he should be doing and didn't have an answer for the punches that Fury would throw. And again, you you and I watched this fight live when it happened. It was a boring affair to be kind to it. (laughs) But we also didn't have any doubt in our mind that when the fight was over, Tyson Fury had pretty comprehensively won almost every round of the fight just through this stymieing style that he put forth against Vlad. And Vlad just... Vlad seemed checked out at points. He really didn't seem like a guy we had noticed to to see an opening and go for it. And it was kind of a watershed moment. Again, to, to all things being fair... Vlad is at the time almost 40 years old. He's 39 and a couple months away from 40. But at the same time, his reactions weren't there. His timing wasn't there. And to be fair to Tyson Fury, a lot of that was because of the movement, the reflexes, the uh, angle changes, and everything he did to make it a bad fight. But normally in those fights, Vladimir is the one who's doing well. And instead, Tyson's the one who came out ahead. So Tyson Fury, unfortunately, has some mental health and substance abuse problems, and he ends up stepping away from the sport, confounding, once again, uh, Vladimir Klitschko's efforts to get a rematch from Tyson Fury. And so the sport moves on, life moves on, and two years later, he is able to get a fight with up-and-coming British phenom Anthony Joshua, who is currently the unified heavyweight champion of the world. And Anthony Joshua, despite having some difficulties in this fight, is able to finish Vladimir Klitschko and end his career at Wembley Stadium in London on April 29, 2017, with a TKO in the 11th round. And Anthony Joshua walks away as the IBF, WBA Super, and IBO heavyweight champion, uh, where... We'll talk about this next month, but he will continue to have some difficulties, get over those difficulties, and someday we'll get a date, a a date and uh, place for soon. Hopefully, maybe by the end of this podcast, Anthony Joshua versus for the end of June, early July. I have my I have my hopes up, Mark. I I really feel like this one's going to happen. I uh, I, yeah, I already told my wife of like whatever date that ends up being in June or July. Don't make any fucking plans. Um, <laughs> yeah, I already told work, guys. I don't know when this day off is going to need to happen, but it's going to need to happen. For sure, for sure. Um, and that's the tale of Vladimir Klitschko. He ends his career um, with 64 wins, five losses total. Um, but let's let's talk about this Joshua fight, though, for a moment. Because yes. we talked about how awful the Fury fight is. In the, in the Joshua fight, and... Let, now, let's let's underscore this. A couple of years before this, Vladimir's head trainer that he had been working with for years who really reinvigorated his style and helped him, Manuel Stewart, had passed away. And that's significant. Um, when a guy comes in and reevaluates your style and really molds you into the most effective type of heavyweight you can be, and all of a sudden he's not there anymore, it's a big thing. Yep. And that you know that guy may have had an apprentice, and he did. He had Jonathan Banks, who was a former cruiserweight contender, and, and a good a good trainer. Don't don't get me wrong. He, he Jonathan Banks was a good trainer, but 
there was part of Manny that would really invigorate guys. And you can look through history and see when Manny was training a guy versus when Manny wasn't. And there are differences in them stylistically. There's only one guy I can really point to in history where they left Manny and they wound up being a better fighter after the fact. And that's Mike McCallum. And we can talk about Mike McCallum on another show another day, but Manny really got the most out of his guys 99% of the time. Whether you look at the Cronkle on, like, of course, Manny's most famous, you know, people is Thomas Hearns. And let, let's look at Thomas Hearns because without, without Manny in his corner, you know, Thomas still achieved great things because he was a great fighter and that was going to happen. But he didn't do them with the same level of efficacy and everything that he had when he had Manny with him. Once Manny is gone from Vladimir's corner, he's not the same fighter. And I can think back to the Eddie Chambers fight in March of 2010 when Vladimir seemingly won every round of that fight. But Manny, you know, not ever trusting the justice, is, is yelling viciously at Vladimir, take this motherfucker out! Because he knew Eddie wasn't offering any real resistance where Vladimir would be in harm's way. And sure enough, in that 12th round, Vladimir comes out and hits him with a left hook that just puts him to sleep face down. And when Manny was gone, a part of Vladimir was gone too at that point. And we go into this Joshua fight with Jonathan Banks in his corner. Vladimir fought like Manny was with him in that fight because in that fight, we got, at 41 years old, to be fair to Vlad, we got knockdowns on both sides, tremendous action, it was it was as great a heavyweight title fight as you'll ever see. And I don't say that lightly, especially after the number of episodes we've done talking about these great fights. But on April 29, 2017, those two guys put it all out there. That fifth round is a round that will go down in history with the knockdown and the comeback. Vladimir put everything he had out there where anybody who ever doubted him or called him a boring fighter or anything, you watch that fight – any time you ever said that should be erased because that fight is a top 10 heavyweight title fight in my mind. And it was a great effort by Vladimir who, even though he lost, I think he won respect in that effort that he put out because it was incredible. And I was so, en I was so engrossed in that fight as it happened. I was so impressed with Vladimir with getting hurt, coming back and, and hurting Joshua and taking him down. I was so impressed with Joshua with how he responded. It was a great fight, and I recommend anybody who even has the slightest hint of like for boxing watch that fight. All right. Um, so before we talk about uh, it, real, real quick, just to sum this up, Klitschko announced his retirement from boxing in 2017, finishing with a record of 64-5 and five with 53 wins by KO and fighting in 29 world title fights. Before we go forward, I want to take a pause for the cause and talk to you about one of our great sponsors called Grammarly. Uh, Pat knows about Grammarly because Gram he uses it Love to Grammarly. send me notes on these wonderful boxers. For you listeners of the Heavyweight Championship Boxing Series here on the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network, brought to you by W2M, Grammarly is offering a free download of the Grammarly software. Grammarly's AI-powered products help people communicate more effectively. Grammarly helps you write mistake-free on uh, Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and nearly anywhere else you write on the web. Grammarly corrects hundreds of grammar punctuations its spelling mistakes while also catching contextual errors, improving your vocabulary, and suggesting style improvements. So to download Grammarly, like I know you want to, you should go to getgrammarly.com slash W2M network. Again, getgrammarly.com slash W2M network to get uh, Grammarly for free. So use our link, get Grammarly for free. It's a win-win situation for all of you listening to this great podcast here tonight. Alrighty, so we've talked about the one brother. Um, and I think we were very fair to him. Now let's talk about the elder sibling, the current mayor of Kiev, I believe, who's actually yeah. trending on Twitter right now. So <laughs> Vladimir's trending on Twitter because it's his birthday. His brother's trending because I think like there's something about like COVID vaccinations for all in, in the Ukraine. So good for him. Um, in any case, Vitaly Klitschko, the elder brother, actually was initially geared towards kickboxing. And boy, does he have a kickboxing physique pad. Holy cow. Uh, Vitaly simultaneously competed in amateur boxing, kickboxing, and sport karate. Vitaly actually fought as a professional kickboxer while under the amateur classification as a boxer, winning multiple professional kickboxing titles, fighting the likes of James Waring, who would also win a professional boxing title, 
Brad Hefton, and William Van Roosmalen, who is the father of current glory star Robin Van Roosmalen. Vitaly would finish his kickboxing career with a record of 34-2 and two, while not having as distinguished an amateur boxing career as Vladimir. He did have an outstanding record of 195-15 to 15 to Vlad's 134-6. to six. He did, however, win the 1995 World Good Military. Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine combining those two records together. Yeah. You get, you get about 300 wins versus maybe 20 losses. <laughs> 21. 21 specifically. Oh. But yeah, it's crazy, right? Um, he did, however, win the 1995 World Military Games and was expected a, a berth in the 1996 Olympics before the aforementioned banned substances test, which Vitaly himself admitted he accidentally ingested, but never failed the test afterwards. As professional kickboxing, and still doesn't, did not offer the same financial potential as boxing, Vitaly would turn professional with Vladimir in 96. Vitaly faced an arguably tougher level of opponent than Vladimir on his way up, culminating in his winning the unrecognized WBO title from Britain's Herbie Hyde in a vicious second round KO, which, take pla- which takes place in the London Arena in England on June 26, 1999, which gave him his 25th win. Um, so, yeah, yikes, Pat. <laughs> what a thrashing on Herbie Hyde. My goodness. Yeah, her, poor Herbie. Um, <laughs> Herbie's biggest fight to this point had been with Riddick Bowe, and he was down six times in the fight. And a lot of people choked that up to nerves. Um, and, and maybe in part it still was, because Herbie never looked all that comfortable in his backyard against Vitaly when he saw him standing across the ring. It's probably why Herbie eventually dropped down to cruiserweight. Uh, but yeah, uh, Herbie could punch, if nothing else. And he saw no way to hurt Vitaly, who just marched right over him and took that belt. Um, Vitaly would make two defenses of the title before losing it to the aforementioned Chris Bird. Now, Bird, this is a this is a very unfortunate fight for Vitaly because on the one hand, Bird can't get anything together. Bird is having a hard time getting any sustained offense, and was pretty much dominated by Vitaly. Unfortunately, Vitaly quit on the stool after nine rounds because he done tore his rotator cuff, which he did not know at the time. Um, want to talk about that just for just a moment? Do you, do you know who actually was supposed to be the opponent for Vitaly in this fight before Chris Bird? Who? Razor Ruddick. Really? How about that? Razor Ruddick was initially supposed to be the uh, opponent, but he pulled out due to uh, apparently testing positive for hepatitis. Yes. And Bird was actually training at the time to fight a former U.S. Olympian, Lawrence Claybay, and stepped in on short notice to take the fight. So, yet another stumbling block for the Klitschko boys. Vitaly would respond with a five-fight win streak, four by KO over opponents either ranked in the top ten or whom had challenged a world champion. Vitaly would not be denied and found himself on the verge of working out a deal to fight lineal heavyweight champion at the time, Lennox Lewis, which we talked about in a previous podcast. And go back and listen to it and hear Pat's fun story about how he missed the Lennox Lewis-Vitaly Klitschko fight. Um, um, so I was really hoping you wouldn't bring that up. Goshen, New York, uh, <laughs> June 21st, 2003 is the date. I was dragged to a graduation party of someone who I wasn't even really friends with. My family was friends with. I was staying with an uncle at the time because my dad was in a stupor. It happens, kids. That's what goes on. Uh, I'm living that legacy proudly. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, uh, um, we literally got there at about... 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The fight's probably not going to happen until 11 p.m., and I'm thinking, oh, we got plenty of time. Eventually, we're sitting at this party playing Grand Theft Auto Vice City on PlayStation 2 to give you a time frame to work with if you're a gamer. And if, I'm counting down the clock. I'm like, oh, it's 5 o'clock. We'll be fine. Oh, 6 o'clock. We'll probably leave soon. 7 o'clock. We're still not leaving. Okay, I wonder what's going on. Ah, 8 o'clock. We're saying goodbyes, whatever. Uh, 9 o'clock. What the hell happened to the Irish goodbye where you just slip out unnoticed? <laughs> <laughs> 10 o'clock, we're on the road, not knowing where we're going because my uncle's half in the bag, driving the car, and we stop at a gas station because he has to pee, not for directions. My aunt, thank God, asked for directions. We're going to go to a Howard Johnson's a half a mile down the road. Everything's great. Howard Johnson's, when we pull in, has it advertised on the logo, HBO. Great. Awesome. Jump in the room, look at the guy, turn on the HBO, and we are rolling the end credits of the fight, letting me know that Vitali was stopped on cuts in six rounds against Lennox Lewis, not on pay-per-view. 
<laughs> yep. All that. All that. Was right that there. a good? Uh, was that a good summarization? Of it, it really was. It was. I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, Please <laughs> listen to the prior show on Lennox if you haven't heard the whole story. It's much more heart wrenching with a lot of details involved. <laughs> there were violins playing. The children were crying. Women were were, were crying. It was all. Ugh, it was all very heart wrenching. But are case, we going to talk? To, are we going to talk to Lennox Lewis fight a little bit? Go ahead. Uh, okay, so this was supposed to be a double header on HBO. That's why it wasn't advertised as a pay per view. Because generally at this point in time, Lennox Lewis is the real deal undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, even though he doesn't have all the belts. He's a pay-per-view attraction, so anytime he's going to fight, it's on pay-per-view, whether it's David Tua, whether it's, you know, whoever. Lennox is a pay-per-view guy. He's the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. you got to pay to see him. However, Lennox's original opponent is Canadian Kirk Johnson, who uh, was not seen as a legitimate threat to Lennox by the WBC, who's the sole sanctioning body title that Lennox holds at the time. They don't even recognize the fight as a world title fight, so it's going to be on HBO because it's not even a pay-per-view worthy main event. Vitali is going to fight on the undercard of this fight in double header, and then the plan is they'll launch these two together in a pay-per-view in November of the same year. Ten days out from the fight, Kirk Johnson pulls out, citing a back injury. I can't fight. First of all, if I'm fighting for the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world, I don't care if my my I have gangrene. I'm going to cut off whatever it is. I'm going to fight for it. Because the payday is much too much to miss, let alone the potential chance of being the world heavyweight champion. My goodness. Okay. Rant over. Uh, upon hearing this, Vitali's camp is like, hey, we'll take the fight. We're already training the fight. We'll take the fight. Lennox, who had been training to fight Kirk Johnson, not Vitali Klitschko, agrees to this. And when you're – to paint a fair picture – there are, you train at a different level for certain types of guys, especially if you're good and you know. Lennox Lewis is the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world is not training as hard out for Kirk Johnson because there's very little chance that Kirk Johnson is going to trouble him and beat him. When on 10 days notice, that opponent changes to Vitali Klitschko, who instead of being a short, stocky Canadian heavyweight with a decent punch and mediocre skills, becomes a six foot seven well-trained European style heavyweight that's a big game changer and I still to this don't this day don't know understand I don't know how or why Lennox's team agreed to let him fight Vitaly on that notice but they did and what we got was six rounds of the best heavyweight action you will ever see with Vitaly suffering a horrific cut in the third round off a of Lewis right hand and you know, we didn't talk about it much, but when Vitali lost to Chris Bird, a lot of people wrote him off and labeled him as a quitter because of his shoulder injury. They were like, oh, you know, a real heavyweight would have fought through that. A real man would have fought through that. It's just a shoulder. It's fine, et cetera, et cetera. That's well, really a ridiculous thing, you know, for, for boxing, band, boxing fans to have said or thought, considering you need a shoulder to throw punches. I go back to that quote of, you know, in chess, nobody's an expert, but everybody plays. In boxing, everybody's an expert, but nobody fights. Right. And it was, you know, it was that time, and, you know, he tore his shoulder. He decided his, the length of his career was more important than that one fight. And in this fight, to see him cut horrifically, and this is a bad cut. This is his eyelid basically hanging off. And he's demanding the fight continue, go on, because he's leading on the scorecards at the time. And all official scorecards had the, the fight 4-2 to two for Vitali. He rocked Lewis, hurt him, and Lewis had his moments too, don't get me wrong, but Vitali was in control of the fight majority, and because he got stopped on a cut, people were you know, rallying behind him and saying, this isn't fair, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Vitali basically in one night won back everybody who ever thought he was a doubter or, or a quitter and doubted him, I should say. So, unfortunate stumbling block with Lennox Lewis. Um, but he recovers. Couldn't get a rematch. Uh, so instead, he smashes Kirk Johnson in two rounds, and then he fights Corey Sanders, who had decimated... Uh, his brother in two rounds for the vacant WBC and lineal recognition as the heavyweight championship of the world. And that takes place on April uh, 24th, 2004, giving him a 34 in two win. He, uh, as I said, he won, wins the vacant WBC and the ring heavyweight titles. 
and that's at the Staples Center. And a great fight. Yes, sir. Um, moving on. Klitschko would make a defense against England's Mike Tyson's uh, conquering Danny Williams. Williams hit the canvas eight times before finally seeing the fight stopped. However, lingering shoulder issues going back to his fight with Bird forced the champion to retire, albeit briefly. During his time away, while his brother Vladimir became the dominant heavyweight, Vitaly became an active champion of his people, becoming a politician, which he is today, in his native Ukraine campaigning for human rights. So he takes off for four years. So his last fight, this one being with Danny Williams, as I said, at the Mandalay Bay Event Center in Nevada, um... Even though he retains his titles, he has to step away from the sport uh, for four years. He'll come back on October 11th, 2008 at the O2 World in Berlin, Germany, where he'll win the WBC heavyweight title from the aforementioned Samuel Peter. All right. So tell me about the Samuel Peter fight. So when Vitaly retires based on his shoulder injuries, the WBC does something unprecedented. They recognize him as what's called champion emeritus, which, you know, for those who don't know Latin, emeritus is basically in a summation. You're the man whenever you want to come back, whatever title he held, that's yours. Yeah, it's currently Manuel Char because he couldn't, <laughs> allegedly couldn't get into Florida to fight uh, Trevor, um, Trevor Bryant. Yeah, so the WBC comes up with this champion emeritus status and awards it to Vitali. In that, if Vitaly, you ever want to come back and fight, whatever, you will immediately be able to fight for the heavyweight championship in your first outing back. And after a long time of rehab while doing his politician thing, Vitaly says, yes, I'd like to come back. And my first fight, yeah, I will fight Sam Peter. And again, we talked about Sam Peter earlier and the fact that Sam Peter had fought his brother. Vladimir and dropped him three times when they fought and is not exactly the uh, easiest touch to fight after four years off. You know, he had fought James Tony twice, Julius Long, and knocked out personal friend Oleg Moskayev to win the WBC heavyweight title. So he comes in to fight Vladimir, to, to fight Vitali. And Vitali, who's been off for all this time, people are asking questions. Does he have his, his cardio? Can he still do what he did before? Vitaly goes in there and dominates Sam with ring control and generalship and just hitting him with combination punches off of Sam's big power shots. And it's – you would have thought Sam was the guy who had a four-year layoff instead of Vitaly who just comes off just tattooing him, little effort involved. It was impressive to watch in the least, in the least expansive way to say it. Vitaly just had everything working for him and was so good and so tuned in for this fight. It was impressive to watch. So he goes on to make uh, two WBC heavyweight title retentions, uh, defenses rather. Uh, first one is in Stuttgart, Germany on March 21st, 2009. Rutikios won Carlos Gomez in the ninth round. He then comes to the States and here we go again. And again, let's let's like we pointed out with Vladimir, Vitaly at this point in time is 38 years old. Mm -hmm. So this is a big um, opportunity for Vitaly Klitschko to win over some American fans. This is an opportunity to make him, you know, the other guy in the eyes of American fans, really build up his, uh, his cachet with the fans, show him what he can do. And so they put in there with him, Chris Ariola. He was the number one contender. Uh, he's a Mexican power puncher with an unbeaten record of 27 fights, and uh, many believed that he was a threat to Vitaly. So this guy is no pushover. He, you know, he's a good fight. He's supposed to give Vitaly the business, and we fans are supposed to benefit from their contest. What actually happens on poor HBO <laughs> is our three commentators kind of looking at each other going, well, <laughs> is someone going to stop this fight? Because this guy's got nothing for Vitaly. After about the fourth or fifth round, they were like, it's done. He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Someone stopped the fight. They were, they were, <laughs> I watched this earlier. And it's like, they, they, they're literally arguing with them. It's like, is anyone going to come and save this guy? And it's not like he got like knocked down repeatedly. Um, they ended up, the referee finally stops the fight in uh, round 10. But 
Yeah, about halfway through, the commentators were like, it's done, it's over, get him out of there. And (laughs) Joey (laughs) Spaghetti... He's already dead. And the referee, Joey Spaghetti, or whatever his name was, they made a point of saying he was Italian, was like, yeah, he's fine. (laughs) It's fine, it's fine. You know. But this this is the thing, okay? So, Chris the Nightmare Areola... Undefeated knockout artist. This is the guy who's going to challenge Vitaly. At the time, I had just started writing for 411 Mania when they still had a boxing hub. And they put myself and another writer named Ryan Bates, who was good lord. I don't know how this guy ever got hired. Seemed to know nothing about boxing as a whole. And I don't say that lightly. I say that because I really feel like he knew nothing about the game. And this is a guy who trained at the top-ranked gym uh, once in a while, whatever. And uh, they, this was one of the fights we profiled, and they were asked, they asked me and Ryan to be the two guys who profiled it. And one of the questions they asked was, oh, who's going to win the exchanges when they happen? And I said, Vitaly's going to win the exchanges. And they were like, well, why did, why, really? I said, yes, but he's going to win the exchanges because the exchanges will never happen because Vitaly's going to dominate the range not let Ariola get close enough to him to land those punches, and he's going to hurt him when he tries. And sure enough, that is exactly what happened in this fight. Every time that Ariola got close enough to try to hurt Vitaly, Vitaly would hit him with these beautiful combinations, and people always get on me for this comparison, and we'll see if you do too based on what you've watched. I always compared Vitaly to Gene Tunney in a sense. And okay. the reason I do that is because Vitali was a guy who fought at long range mm-hmm. with his hands down, who navigated the ring with very good footwork, and because his hands were down, would shoot his punches at this upward angle from his lead hand. His lead left hand would shoot from an upward angle, and because of the position of his body, he would come back with his right hand at a downward angle, giving you a little more juice than what would normally be had. And he could get away with that because while Tunney was a very good guy who could, you know, utilize body movement and head movement to avoid those punches coming back, Vitaly had that advantage because he had such range over his opponents with his long reach and height. And I don't think it's that crazy of a comparison, and I think this fight probably illustrates it better than most because that's what he did. He would bait Ariola in with his left hand and then pound him with a right hand behind it come back with the left and then shift the angle Ariel had no answer and again not to not to shut Chris down he took everything Vitaly had and was still trying to go and there's that memorable post to my interview where he's cursing crying saying I wanted to give more and I couldn't do it but this was a dominant display by a great heavyweight champion against a guy who was assumed to be great but clearly didn't have the tools in his disposal yeah this was this was unfortunate um and I don't know how many fans it made of Vitaly's because, again, I think, I think American fans. And correct me if I'm wrong. If you think if you think I'm wrong, but I think American fans, they, they, you know, they don't mind someone being dominant. But if you're dominant, they want to see you finish the fight. Um, or and they not, wanna... not finish the fight in the sense that the referee is waving it off after a guy just keeps taking punches. They want to see a guy down on his face or on his right. back getting counted out. Yeah, or at the very least, you know, he might be he might be up on his feet, but he's dead on his feet and the referee has to save him from brain damage um you know they people want I, th- I think in america people want to see definitive finishes in boxing and i don't think they put much stock right or wrong they don't put a lot of stock into somebody who dominates but doesn't but doesn't finish or doesn't knock people out or gets routinely unanimous decisions and so, you know, you have this fight where it's completely lopsided. Chris Ariola has nothing for Vitaly. And he but, does not win a round on the official scorecards at all. And, and yet... No more and, and, and though it doesn't go to decision because Luigi finally stepped in and stopped it, it's also... <laughs> they also, you know, I, I don't think Vitaly did himself any favors. Um, and I think he's just fighting his fight. Like, I don't really blame him for that. I don't think you... I think you go in there with the best of intentions and things don't always work out. You know, sometimes it's harder to knock a guy out than you think it's going to be. Um, As someone who's, who's lost his share of fights over time, especially to uh, somebody who is a superior tac- tactician during that time, it's usually not the most pleasing performance, not only for the crowd, but for yourself. Right. 
So yet another, you know, and we, and we started off the show with, well, did they or did they not kill the heavyweight division in terms of popularity and fan interest? Every time a Klitschko comes to America, it they might win, but it doesn't go well. <laughs> like, no, they should have played Neil Diamond's coming to America whenever that happened. That would get people really excited. So, um, next up, <laughs> and I. He uh, he'll defend his title two more times, and then he has an unfortunate fight in Germany with former heavyweight champion oh, Shannon good. Briggs. Oh my God, Pat! You didn't recommend that I watch this fight, and I feel like you were trying to save me from what was Wait, you nearly a murder. No, I haven't watched. I wanted to watch this, but oh, I, just, I just ran no. out of time. But this was I, not. You did not recommend this fight. And in the notes you sent me, you were like, I'm just going to quote you here. In a fight that made me so uncomfortable, I stopped watching it eight rounds in. <laughs> And this is a unanimous decision win, which clearly should have been stopped earlier. What happened to poor Shannon? The, 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 I've seen guys die in the ring. Oh, God. We have fun here. We don't. We don't joke. You know, we we joke and everything. I've seen guys legitimately be killed from the punishment they took in a fight in the ring. God help me. I don't know why my dad let me watch the Ray Mancini Duku Kim fight. I was watching live when Beethoven Scotland died on the USS Intrepid after that fight. I was watching this Vitaly Klitschko uh, Shannon Briggs fight live on an internet stream at the time. And I thought I was seeing a man who was going to get hurt and die. And I don't say that lightly. I don't say that to make you guys laugh. Like I, I say a lot of comments to make you guys laugh during this show. And this isn't one of them. I saw Shannon Briggs, who I've met in person. I happen to have a lot of respect for Shannon, and I like him. I saw in this fight a guy who was taking such an amount of punishment from someone who is so good and not dealing any in return and really getting hit with these shots that I thought his life was in danger. And I thought this fight needed to be stopped if not by the referee, by his corner. I was watching this on a time. I was, I was part of a boxing forum called No BS Boxing, and a lot of guys who were from Sheridog had migrated over there. And we we're all pretty, for the most part, educated boxing fans. The few of us who were watching this fight live were all kind of unanimously in, I don't want to say disgust, but we were all in fear of what could happen to Shannon if this fight was continually allowed to go on? Has there ever been any, like, has anyone ever gone back and talked to the referee, or has there any been any insight as to why they allowed it to continue? Right? Like, what the referee thought he saw? No, and I have no idea to this point why, because Shannon has said in this fight that he tore his rotator cuff and his asthma, his asthma which had been proven to be, you know, a thing that halted him in certain fights... He said that that halted his performance. He tore his rotator cuff in his, in his left arm, and his asthma was not great, and et cetera. At the same time, you know, your corner's there for a lot of reasons. Your corner's also there to protect you from yourself. And whoever was in Shannon's corner that day, I fucking hate you because you didn't protect Shannon from taking punishment he didn't need to take. His face was mangled. His body was beaten. He was taking punches he didn't need to take. And the only thing that kept him standing up was his heart and his will. And my God, what an, what an, ex expi what an ex exhibition of heart and will that he showed to stand up in the face of all this punishment and horrendous beating. And it, I don't want to call it inspiring because it's a dangerous thing to do. But Shannon to stand up to that is an incredible man that I can't ever measure and I'll probably never measure myself against because I won't measure up to that but Vitali to shut down all of Shannon's offense and Shannon is again former lineal heavyweight champion of the world won the WBO heavyweight championship of the world Vitali completely shut him down and dominated him and put beat him up to the point where I thought this fight I had to stop watching the fight because I thought Shannon was either going to die or get seriously hurt that's not a good thing that I was so uncomfortable, and I can watch any fight. I was so uncomfortable, I thought this was going to be a tragedy in the ring. 
Yeah, we've seen guys get mangled before. Deontay Wilder and the Tyson Fury fight looked pretty messed up. It was a fight recently in the UFC between Alistair Overeem and um, Rosenstrike, I believe it was, who mangled Just... mangled um, Alistair Overeem's lip. Like it was like hanging off. No, this no, this was this was different in the sense that it was progressively worse each round as it got on. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, I've seen fights that are one sided. I've seen fights that where one guy is very much hurt and the other's fine. This was different. No, and, and maybe history was kicking in on me a little bit, knowing that I'd seen these fights between Ray Mancini and Duke Kim, the the Beethoven Scotland tragedy that happened to both the USS and Trepid in two thousand one. It, it was. It was scary to watch, and I, I don't say that lightly. And uh, you guys have listened to our podcast, hopefully more than a couple episodes, and understand what we've watched through this. This was scary. This was I thought a man was going to die, and I don't say that lightly. And, and it's not like they had it in some dark part of the world. It was in Germany, where they've done tons of fights before, and will continue to do tons of fights. It's however it's a really bizarre thing. However, to, to be fair, Germany's. Uh, Sanctioning bodies have never been exactly seen as on the up and up, and I, I I'm not going to spend time shitting on Germany. It is what it is. They're not exactly the most high held commission, and we'll leave it at that. All right. Well, the unfortunate business with Shannon aside, um, he has a quick KO of Oddly Oddlinier Solis. Old Lanier. Old Lanier. Old Lanier. Thank you. Um, then he next defends against former light heavyweight and cruiserweight champion Poland's, just Oof. say it. Tomas Tom. Adamic. Can there I personalize go. this one too, Mark? Go, please. Absolutely. Uh, at the time, I was a store manager for a, an office supply company. I won't name them by name. A, friend, a, a guy I had befriended who was working there, one day he took off his work shirt when we were closed up and everything. He had a Tomas Adamic shirt on underneath. And I was like, oh, man, that's Tomas Adamic. He was... You know who he is? I was like, yeah, he's a great cruiserweight. He's moving up to heavyweight. And this guy was a super fan. He loved Tomas Adamic because he was Polish. And, you know, Adamic was Polish. And it was a whole thing. And he, Adamic had been in some great fights with an Australian fighter at the light heavyweight level named Paul Briggs to win those titles. He'd beaten Steve Cunningham, who was a very good cruiserweight to become the cruiserweight champion of the world. Adamic was a very well-polished, good fighter. And they made the announcement that he was the mandatory to Vitali. And... I told Tommy, who was the guy I worked with, I said, Tommy, Vitaly's not going to lose a round in this fight, and he's going to hurt Adamic and probably stop him late. And Tommy, who was, like, shocked by that prediction, he was like, no, come on, man. Adamic's a great fighter. Like, he's going to get in there. He's going to do his thing. He's going to, you know, he's going to win some, you know, like, even if he didn't believe he was going to win it, he thought Adamic would perform at least at a level that was kind of even keel. And I said, Tommy, th- this is how it's going to be. Like, if Vitaly's going to hurt him and beat him up and stop him and that fight happened on a Saturday afternoon on HBO and I lived in a town in Jersey at the time where the community was heavily Polish so a lot of my friends on Facebook and everything they're very Polish like Polska yeah go Adamic they all knew about this fight and again Tomas Adamic is a great fighter he was completely outmatched in this fight and beaten up and hurt and stunned. Yeah. And this, is just... an, this is another one where the commentators are like, you have got to go after Vitali. They are like screaming at Adamic. Stop waiting. Stop trying to go punch for punch with him. Just bum rush the guy. Do something. And it never happens. And because again, to his credit, the reason he doesn't bum rush him is because Vita- the threat of Vitali is so large and looming that he's going to hurt this guy if you go after him recklessly. And Adamic couldn't get past that. And when they stop it finally, it was one of those things where after the fight, Tommy comes up to me and he's like, you knew what you were talking about the whole time. And I was like, yeah, I did, because he's a great little man against a great big man. And a great big man's going to hurt him and beat him up. After that point, I actually started training Tommy to learn how to box because he took my advice so seriously at that point. And, again, you look at Vitaly in his career at this point, he's 40 years old, dominating younger, stronger, not necessarily stronger, but younger, hungrier guys who are coming along on the pipe after Vitaly's been retired for years at a time, and he's coming and he's dominating them. These scientific beatdowns is no other way to say it. It's a scientific beatdown with his hands down, daring them to come in, shooting his left hand up at this angle, following with the right hand, and just comprehensively beating these guys on every level. It's really 
I'll get into myself, but it's really impressive to watch still to this day. So um, he finishes up with his final two fights, one being Derek Chisora on February 18th, 2012. Uh, he where, glossed me. He glossed me. Where he... Uh, oh, that's right. That's that fight. Um, where he uh, <laughs> wins a unanimous decision in 12 rounds. Then he cleans up before retiring um, due to his shoulder in a four-round TKO against Manuel Char uh, in the Olympic Stadium in Moscow on... September 8th, 2012. Um, go ahead and tell me about these two fights before we close up. I mean, against Derek Chisora, he fought a guy who was hungry, who wanted it, and did go after him. Like, let's give Chisora credit. Where yeah, credit Chis- Chisora w- w- was winging some really, like, it reminded me actually of the Usyk fight um, a couple of months back, where he he has a lot of power in those meaty arms. Yeah, Chisor, Chisor's a, a heavy puncher, and he really did go after Vitali in this fight. It was it was kind of shocking to see that he wasn't discouraged by Vitali's power immediately. So, but to his credit, Vitali, okay, this guy's not scared of my power. I'm still going to hit him, but now I'm going to limit where he can hit me, type of thing. And again, much to the purest delight and the casual's detriment. Vitali would nail him with combinations, hurt him on the outside, and as soon as Chisora was able to finally get on the inside after eating these punches, Vitali would tie him up, and the referee would break them up, and Vitali would just start tattooing him from the outside again. And he really did a good number on Chisora, uh, partly personally motivated because of the way in Chisora slapped him open-handed, and uh, much like much like Vlad against David Hay. Rather than get emotionally invested, Vitali just disqualified all that from his head and saw what's the best way to humiliate this guy. I'm going to win the fight. And dominated the fight as a whole. It, it, despite his really spirited effort from Chisora, who just really didn't know how to land his big shots cohesively enough to stop Vitali's offense, which really hurt him off and on. And Manuel Shar, who is from uh, Syria was his mandatory challenger after that point. So Char had had a pretty decent record for the most part. At this point in time, he was 21-0, but he hadn't really fought anybody. Uh, and Vitali just opened him up with a cut and stopped him. And there's not a lot to write home about this fight. This is just typical Vitali dominating an opponent who didn't have a ton to offer back in, in resistance to what he could do so well. And... The last fight Vitaly was supposed to have, he was supposed to defend against Berman Stavern, who was his mandatory challenger. He did train to to defend this title at this point, but again, the shoulder, which had been nagging him since the Chris Bird fight in 2000, really kind of just, at that point, Vitaly was like, this shoulder is, is constantly hurting and tearing. I had a tear in my last fight against it. I think it's time to hang it up because... There's nothing to gain for me by beating Berman Stavern and continuing on. And he goes, I'm never going to fight my brother because of a promise they had made to their mother when they were kids that they would never fight each other. And while certain people were upset about that, the brothers used it to find their legacies. And that's why almost it's, it's a weird kind of comparison where you don't really compare them as one or the other. You kind of almost compare them as a pair. Yeah, um, I want to end the show by talking a little bit about them not fighting each other. Now, they made a promise. You've already covered that. They are brothers. They didn't want to fight each other. But it's a little deeper than that, a little bit more involved. Both of them have said, and commentators have talked about it, that part of the reason... It's not just that they're brothers. Um, brothers fight. You know, things happen. If certainly, some might be motivated by... Brothers fight, by, fight the Lord. Everybody fights. Yeah. Uh, you know, it might be motivated by billions of dollars. I mean, you know, look, Klitschko versus Klitschko probably would have been a, you know, a million dollar plus pay-per-view. I think people... They're probably about it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, they would have filled up a stadium, whether it be in, you know, Moscow Stadium or Wembley Stadium. Um, or they could have come to America and done it in like Texas or whatever. Wherever they went, they would have they would have sold out. That's an attraction. Um, they have both said that the biggest reason why they never fought each other, aside from the obvious ones, was they're they're so competitive they'd have really hurt one another. 
and and that's it. You know, nothing really more needs to be said about it. There, there, there comes a point did where did you flash back? Did you flash back to the episode of The Simpsons where Bart and Lisa were on opposite hockey teams when you read that? <laughs> we came for blood. Um, now that you mentioned it, it's actually really funny. So yeah, um, it's so kill Bart, kill. <laughs> So the Klitschko era, defined by not one, but two boxers, brothers. And I go back to the question that started us off tonight. Um, Did they kill the business? And I'm going to go ahead and say no, because the business is not just the United States. Um, These guys put on good numbers across Europe. These guys were superstars across Europe. I think to have an American-centric point of view on the Klitschkos and say, well, the, you know, the decade plus that they were champions here in America was a desolate wasteland of heavyweights. No, well, too fucking bad. <laughs> like, the world is bigger than that. Our, our two biggest, best heavyweights in the world right now are both guys from the UK. And uh, it, yeah. It is what it is. Um, but but again, I'll give you let's, the- let's go... Again, to be to be fair, we, we cry for American heavyweights and, and all this stuff and, and you know, oh why why isn't there an American Deontay Wilder, blah blah blah. Deontay Wilder didn't even start training to be a heavyweight boxer until he was in his twenties. Right. Okay. Uh you know, as somebody who was a boxer in their youth and wanted to be a, a fighter and wanted to be a professional fighter and wanted to be a, an Olympic champion and a world champion, I started training when I was eleven years old. And I was rare in that sense because at the time, guys who want to be fighters, and especially the great fighters, okay, you, you, and to, to put it in perspective, I grew up in the late 80s, early 90s, into the 90s, right? I'm slightly younger than Mark. The outreach at the time for athletes in the United States did not endear itself to heavyweight boxing. It endeared itself to football, right. American-style football, let's be clear, Basketball, to a lesser extent, baseball. Boxing was kind of abhorred by people who didn't want to see it supported, didn't want to see it uh, succeed because of the violent nature, etc. And as a result, we saw boxing programs canceled from high schools, uh, which had, even into the 90s, many boxing programs were in high schools. Colleges, which to, to this point, with the exception of the Ivy League, really don't have boxing programs, which is a sad, sad thing to this day. Um, and again, the, the reason a lot of guys fight, okay, and we'll, we'll kind of circle back even to the, to the first episode of the show that we did. The reason a lot of guys fight is because they don't have any other means to better their situation. Right. They fight because they are hungry and they want it. And a lot of times with a little bit of training, that motivation with that training will get them to where they want to be. They're, they're no longer hungry. They're no longer starving. They're no longer cold. They have what they want. And the United States in the 1980s and on has offered so many short-term solutions to the populace who – would normally take that route and honestly Gil Clancy himself the legendary trainer Gil Clancy said the biggest obstacle to great American heavyweights from the 80s and on was crack cocaine because guys who came from these areas that have produced such champions like Mike Tyson like Riddick Bowe like Shannon Briggs saw an easier route to get rich and get out of their situation by selling and using crack cocaine than they did to work as a fighter and become something for themselves. In Europe, that didn't happen. And as a result, we get guys like Vladimir, like Vitaly, like Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua, Dillian White, Alexander Povetkin, all these great European heavyweights who come up and achieve. Okay. And that is, I think, where we're going to leave you tonight. But before we do, we want to uh, tell you about another one of our great sponsors here on the Rattled and Broadcasting Network and the W2M Network, and that is AmazonMusic.com. Good you know, Lord, we, I love you, Amazon Music. It's great. 
Uh, almost anything you want, you would need to find in terms of music is there. And if you, you know, what you can find on there, Mark. What can you find on there, Pat? You can find "Can't Find My Way" by Hardline, which is what song is sponsoring the show tonight. <laughs> Perfect. Um, you can find all kinds of Def Leppard, Def Leppard, and Nelson and Hanson and all all, all the bands you love. Uh, they're all there on AmazonMusic.com, and you should use our link: uh, GetAmazonMusic.com/slash/w2mnetwork. GetAmazonMusic.com/slash/w2mnetwork to get your free 30 days of Amazon Music, and then you can check out all the soundtracks that we promote here through our movie reviews. Um, you can download our- Tarzan Boy by Baltimore. There you go. Um, there's all kinds of stuff out there for you to enjoy if you'd only download AmazonMusic.com and, and you enjoy You can't it. download the bottle of Pinot Grigio I've drinking during this, this podcast, though. You could go back and listen to our review of Too Old to Die Young and get yourself some Mandy by Barry Manilow, because why wouldn't you? I right. mean, it's a great song. <laughs> it is a great song. I don't care what anyone says. All right, um, so that's it, Pat. That is 16 chapters of the late great history <laughs> Of heavyweight boxing, the next chapter we're going to do is in that, it, this is our final chapter. The next thing we're going to do is an epilogue, and that epilogue is called Modern Times, and we're going to round things back to where we started. We're going to look at, in brief, uh, Anthony Joshua, Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder, uh, Alexander. Really, those those three guys amongst mm-hmm. many many other pretenders, but those are the three we're going to really focus on. Yeah. Um, we probably should talk a little bit, though, about Alexander Usyk, just you know, just because. Um, in any case, uh, we're going to do that on April 29th, in theory. And that's it. That's going to be the last of this particular series. However... But that's not the end of boxing on the Revolution Broadcasting. No, app. not at all. Um, not to mention, we're still going to do commentaries whenever there's a good one. Like, myself and Chris Bailey are going to be doing a commentary for Jake Paul versus Ben Askren, because, oh boy, <laughs> can't wait well, for that. Not- Antonio Tarver versus Frank Mir, and that's unfortunate. Yeah, that is unfortunate. Um, so Pat and I are going to do starting next month, the week of WrestleMania. We're going to do our, we're going to start reviewing uh, all thirty six previous WrestleManias. Um, Not one all at separate time. shows. No. Um, so we're going to start with WrestleMania one. It's called the Mania of WrestleMania. We're going to start at the beginning next month, uh, and then we'll do the epilogue. But we're going to keep going because we like this. We like doing the show, and there's so much boxing out there. There's so many weight classes, so many great boxers. We had the recent passing, not to make up not Pat upset, we had the recent passing of Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Um, we want to talk about that. So as a matter of fact, our very first show on May 27th, um, and we're just shortening this now to the History of Boxing podcast, we'll be talking about the Fab Four, Roberto Duran, the late Marvin Hagler, Sugar Ray Leonard, and Thomas Hearns. And then as we continue to do the series... We'll, uh, we'll bop all over the history of boxing in different weight classes and whatnot, and we'll continue to do this. So um, I think that's great. I, I also think it's great. And uh, I'm, hoping we, I'm hoping we just, you know, people who are interested in boxing, I hope you enjoy the show. I hope we really, we really want to not necessarily educate you because we're, we're, you know, we're operating off of, resources and, and historical events and experiences personally but we just want to see if there's an interest for you guys and if we can exploit that interest and kind of explain some things to you along the way and maybe give you some context you didn't know we're really hoping for that more than anything and we hope you have fun most importantly during the the experience we've had channeling the heavyweight championship from 1889 until the present day which is uh it, it's been fun for me I know it's been fun for Mark and we, we just enjoy it and we're going to take a look at a secondary period in boxing history that's, to me, arguably as much, if not more, fun than the heavyweight championship itself. When we look at the four kings of the '80s, and we're really hoping you guys stay tuned for that. And Mark brought up the passing of marvelous Marvin Hagler, and uh, uh, not to be morose, but that's the reason I ever put on a pair of gloves in the first place. And so, you can guarantee some very, uh, very enlightened, very, very thoughtful, very. Uh, in-depth commentary on Marvin, on Roberto Duran, on Sugar Ray Leonard, on Thomas the Hitman Hearns, and even some other guys who floated around the Four Kings at the time, like Wilfred Benitez. So, yep, um, and we'll, we'll continue to do boxing commentaries as well. Maybe Pat will come back for some of these. Um, 
you know, we've got the uh, we've got that Jake Paul Ben Askren one. I'm going to do that with Bailey, but you know, we've got some good ones coming up in the future. And there's rumors, there's people are threatening a third to- Tyson Holyfield fight, and I know Pat's going to want to watch that one, so I might have to drag him out of uh, oh commentary retirement for it. Um, Guys, if you ever want to see Mike Tyson get seriously hurt, that's the fight to watch. <laughs> In the meantime, earlier today we reviewed Fastlane, um, including the the wonderful Wizards duel between Alexa Bliss and Randy Orton. Uh, speaking of Wizards, we reviewed the new Rob Zombie album. We reviewed the new WandaVision series, uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League, and I and boy did we have some thoughts about Restore the Snyderverse. Ugh. Yeah, it ugh is right. And then we, we kicked off the week with one of the comics, one of the many comics that actually influenced the writing of WandaVision, Avengers, Vision and the Scarlet Witch, A Year in the Life, 12-issue limited series. Next, <laughs> next, next week, we got uh, a whole bunch of Pacific Rim stuff going on. We've got Pacific Rim, Tales from Year Zero, the Netflix uh, anime series, Pacific Rim, The Black. Um, we'll be reviewing the new Tomahawk album, for those of you that are into the Mike Patton We'll be doing a long road to ruin yes. on the first two. Pacific- Mark and I used to worship at the Church of Mike Patton. For you guys who don't know, <laughs> uh, we'll review the new. We'll um, do a long road to ruin rather on the previous Pacific Rim movies, and then oh boy, we got some wrestling to talk about. MLW. We rarely get to talk about MLW, but I'll tell you that Tom Lawler's Filthy Island was the best show of this year so far. Best wrestling show, but, but by far better than anything anything else I've seen, and I've watched way too much wrestling. Um, but we're going to talk MLW, Never Say Never, featuring Jacob Fatu versus Fat Calvin Tankman. Um, <laughs> that's Wednesday night at 7 on YouTube or wherever else you can find it. We're going to meet myself, Bailey, and Robert Winfrey, who actually covers the Fusion show. Uh, we'll be reviewing that Friday afternoon, so go ahead and check that out. It's going to be a fantastic time. Alrighty, Pat. Um, you got anything else going on? Negative. I only do things with you, Mark. You know that. Fantastic. I don't cheat. <laughs> All right. Um, until then, thank you for joining us here in the history of heavyweight boxing. Uh, until we bring you the epilogue, he's Pat Mullen. I'm Mark Rattlers. Be well, be safe, and behave.